Okay. And so this is our official start of class here. And yeah, welcome everybody to our online CS40. Uh, like I mentioned uh, on the GitHub issue, our family was exposed to, to somebody with COVID. And so I'm not allowed back on CMC's campus right now. And we've done all the testing. We're just waiting for the results to come back to, um, uh, to see when I'll be allowed back on campus. Um, but yeah, so that's why we're online today. I'm gonna to go ahead and share my screen now and we'll talk about, uh, just review how that's going, how this online format's going to affect our uh, class for this week and then talk about our, um, uh, yeah, our actual material for today. Um, so I'm sharing my screen now and I'm going to switch back over here. So again, uh, so today's class on Zoom and our, our quiz today uh, canceled. It's likely going to be, uh, we'll do something else instead of it, uh, but that nothing will happen this week for, for the quiz. Um, let's see, as people come into the Zoom meeting, I'm going to have to switch my screen back and forth like that. Uh, so hopefully that's not too disruptive. I previously had a, a dual monitor set up back in the, the fully remote days, but the second monitor is back in my office now, which I'm not allowed to go get. So, um, so I'll have to switch back and forth between screens occasionally. Uh, but again, yeah, so I was just saying that uh, no quiz at all this week. Uh, sometime next week we'll have something, some sort of alternative to the quiz. Um, because of uh, office hours being canceled, I'm, uh, yeah, so I'm not going to be able to have office hours either uh, today or on Wednesday, uh, but I'll be available uh, after class, basically stay as long as people have questions. Um, my guess is that today will be the maybe the more demand for that since the um, there's the homework due uh, uh, tomorrow. Um, but I'd be happy to answer questions about anything either day. And again, there's no change to the uh, homework to due date. Uh, so still due Tuesday with collaboration. And uh, if for whatever reason this uh, this online format hat impacts your ability to complete this on time, let me know and, and we'll work something out. And, and again, uh, class on Wednesday is going to follow this uh, same format that we're doing today. Maybe before we get into the actual class material, or is there any questions about what um, these administrative changes mean or look like? Okay, I do have, uh, so I have my wife's iPad connected to our Zoom session as well, so I can monitor the, uh, the chats uh, that anybody posts. And also, um, if you have a question, you can uh, just uh, raise your hand. That's probably the best way to uh, get a question answered today. And so I'll be able to monitor those. Um, and there is one question in the chat right now about who invited the NSA and uh, so my wife's iPad, I, I named her account National Security Agency just to remind us all that there's that room 638 in San Francisco that all of our uh, Zoom connections are going through and that big data center in Utah that's recording all of our uh, Zoom connections here. So um, yeah, don't say anything that you wouldn't want the NSA to know. Um, Okay, so, uh, oops, there we go. Today, um, or this week, our topic is uh, web scraping. And um, I've adjusted our uh, format of, of the notes down here a little bit. So today and Wednesday, uh, or sorry, I've combined all of the material that used to be for Monday and Wednesday into just one set of notes here, which we're gonna go over today. And we're going to go uh, relatively fast. Um, so I know a lot of people think the normal classes are relatively fast. 
but the main purpose of this will be to serve as like a, uh, uh, I guess two things. One is as a reference for you uh, when you're wanting to like work on the lab this week or uh, homework and you have encounter a problem and you want to know like how do I get that done, then you'll have sort of a nice relatively clean video that you can come back to and, uh, and, and see how to get that done. The other purpose is that this is going to be sort of like preparing all everything that we're doing today is preparation for what we're going to do on Wednesday, which will be I'm just going to uh, implement the solution to uh, homework three in class on Wednesday over Zoom. And there'll be a few like very minor things that you'll have to um, uh, do uh, to sort of fix up my solution and make it good for submission. Um, but basically all the hard stuff I'm just going to do here on Zoom. And um, as I do this, the, so the intention, especially for the class on Wednesday, is not that you would necessarily be trying to follow along or take detailed notes like you would do in the normal in-person class. Um, but the, the Wednesday class in particular is something that um, you'll, uh, uh, it's probably, so you're welcome to, to attend uh, live, but it's really going to be designed for a, um, a not live uh, reference for you to, to open it up and, and follow along as you're, as you're coding st stuff up on your own. And um, so it might take you maybe three, four, five hours to actually go through the, the Wednesday class. Um, let's see, real quick, I think somebody might have your uh, microphone on. If you could uh, disable that, please. Um, any questions about just the overview of class today before we get started? Actually, maybe one last thing. There's three Python files that we'll be going over today. So uh, if you would like to follow along, uh, these are the three to go ahead and download. We'll be starting with this wget file, then going on to wget2, and ending with the notes.py file. Any questions at this point? Yeah, we'll go ahead. So, do you plan for us to have a quiz next Monday, or is whatever going to happen going to be on the following Wednesday? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so, Wednesday, we won't have time to go over any sort of uh, quiz material. So, uh, no quiz next Monday either. Possibly a quiz next Wednesday. Um, I'll have to think about that. Great question. Any other questions um, so far? OK. Uh, oh, let's see. There's a just a link in the or a question in the chat about whether it's the same Zoom link on Wednesday too, and yes, that it um, will be the same Zoom link. Okay, so before starting with the uh, technical details, I wanna talk really quick about some examples of uh, web scraping in action and starting really with uh, what we're going to be building up with your uh, homework three assignment. Let me refresh this so that four, oh, it's still four. Forgot to change that four to a three. Uh, but the idea of your next homework assignment is you're going to be scraping information from eBay and storing the results in a JSON file. And so what kind of information does that look like? So if we go to uh, ebay.com here, and let's say um, we search for welding masks. And there's a whole bunch of welding masks that, uh, that come up here. And actually, um, this is something that I've had to do for, uh, for a client, for, for my brother. He runs a business that sells uh, tools online through eBay and through Amazon and on his own website. And uh, what he has to do is monitor like what price are other people selling things like welding masks at so that he can set his uh, prices appropriately. And a long time ago, um, it's probably like nine, 10 years ago now, we uh, 
he started getting into this welding mask market, selling it on eBay. And at the time, there was only one person on eBay who was selling welding masks. And uh, my, my brother saw this and saw that he could get um, uh, the same exact welding mask shipped from China for half the price. That the person on eBay was selling it for $20 a piece, he could get it uh, ordered for $10 a piece on China. And uh, so we, we found that out and um, he started underselling the other person for uh, $19 um, uh, for, for the, the welding masks and uh, took all the person's business. Eventually the, the price is equalized down to $11 to $12 for, uh, for that particular welding mask. And the way, that, uh, the, the way that we found this out was that I wrote a script that uh, just traveled all of eBay finding what are the items that are most sold. And we found that this particular welding mask uh, was sold for, or it had about a thousand sales per month. And the other person was making about $10 per sale. And so that was $10,000 per month on just this welding mask that that person was making. And uh, so my brother got into that market, drove the price down, and now everybody gets welding masks for, for a lot cheaper. And so this is the kind of thing that we're going to be doing uh, both today and on Wednesday and in your homework assignment. Um, there's a good question about like how, how legal is it to do these things? How legal is it to write Python programs that interact with the world? Uh, oh, maybe before talking about the legality, one other sort of cool example is if you follow this link, it's to a description of how somebody found that um, they were, uh, Papa John's had a survey that if you completed the survey, they'd give you a free thing of garlic sticks. And so if the person wrote a Python program to complete the survey automatically for him a thousand times per second, and now has a lifetime supply of free garlic sticks from, from Papa John's. Um, and so was it legal to do that? Was it legal to do this, uh, this web scraping that I did on eBay? And the answer is yes, that uh, there's a very famous court case, uh, HIQ versus LinkedIn, that uh, established that anything that is legal for a human to do is legal in the United States for a computer to do to automate that process. And basically what happened in this court case is that uh, so LinkedIn, obviously that social media website that stores uh, user data for um, like resumes and jobs and things like that. Uh, HiQ was trying to break into a similar sort of market, and in order to do that, they scraped all the information off of uh, LinkedIn. And that was, um, uh, LinkedIn didn't like that, and so they, they ended up suing uh, HiQ, saying that you've violated this uh, computer fraud and abuse act. Um, the Supreme Court ended up ruling that uh, if you want to stop somebody from scraping information on your web page, there is no legal remedy for doing that. That you have to use a technical remedy of actually preventing them from getting that information in the first place. So basically, everything that it's legal for a person to do, it's legal for a computer to automate. Um, if you're if you're really interested in legal things, this uh, Wikipedia link uh, shows even more court cases related to that and um, also outside the United States, the different uh, legal aspects. Uh, but the general consensus in like the European Union and every jurisdiction that I'm aware of is that if it's legal for a person to do, it's legal for a computer to automate. Um, okay, so now let's head over to our technical things. Again, we're going over in class today this um, uh, these three files right here, starting with the wget.py. I'm going to switch my screen here over to VS Code and um, opening up this wget.py file. And this file has uh, 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 well, let's see. So what a wget program is, it's a very simple program that gets something from the web. So the W stands for web, like internet, and the get stands for get. And it saves it to your local computer. And the idea of this is um, it's sort of like the hello world of web programming, the simplest program that you can possibly do that involves the internet. 
And I'm going to go ahead and run this program. We'll see what happens, and then we will uh, see why it does what it does. So first of all, down here in my terminal, in order to run this program, I type python3 wget.py. And again, I get this error message saying can't open the wget.py file. That's because my working directory is my CS40 folder, but my wget.py file is saved into my week 8 folder right here. So I first have to CD into my week 8 folder, and then I can run my wget.py file. And uh, nothing actually gets printed to the screen over here. Instead, we can see over here on the left, there's this Dracula.html file. I'm going to go ahead and delete Dracula.html like this. And you'll see that that file does not exist over here. But when I rerun this program, Dracula.html now exists. It's been downloaded from this URL right here and saved to uh, this location right here. I'm going to visit the Dracula.html file. And for those of you who have uh, started the lab that's due on Halloween, you might be familiar with this file already. Um, but this file is the um, from Project Gutenberg, the project that uh, just provides web hosting for every book in the public domain. And Dracula is in the public domain. So this is the text of, Bra of Dracula in HTML format. If we, let's see, keep scrolling down, you can see here's all of the different, um, all of the different text. So how does this, uh, how does this wget program work? Well, the, we already know how to save information to a file once we have some sort of information. It's this uh, open command, uh, we'll use using the w as our mode right here, and then f.write of whatever we want to actually save. The key thing that's different about this, the key thing that we haven't seen before, are these two lines right here, lines 15 and line 16. And these two lines show us how we actually get information from a, from a web page. Um, we use this library requests, and then requests.get sort of is what downloads the, um, downloads all the information about the web page. Turns out that there's a lot of meta information associated with each request that we can do. And so we have to store that in some variable, which is typically called r. And then in order to get the actual text of the web page, we do just r.text in order to get the text. So these two lines here, I guess, along with the import statement, are all that you have to do in order to, um, in order to download something from the internet. The, the requests library here is not built into Python. So if you want to use the requests library, you must run the pip install command, uh, whatever that is for your computer, just like we did with the YouTube download in order to get this requests library. But then once you have it, it's really easy to use like this. The, uh, before moving on to our, to our other files though, I wanna see uh, what some of the error messages look like that we can get from, um, get from request.get and to see what, that, what they mean about our, uh, about our program. The first thing that I wanna do is, so let's take this URL right here and we're gonna copy and paste it into Firefox in order to see what like a correct URL looks like. So come back over here, Firefox, paste the URL, and here is our Dracula web page. But now let's say that uh, instead of pasting the correct URL, I pasted an incorrect URL. So uh, something like a whole bunch of gibberish like this at the end of the URL. And here we get this error 404. Technically, this is still a valid web page. It's still an HTML web page. Um, you can see that it has this formatting. If we right click and do the inspect element, uh, you can see that there's all of this HTML down here. So this is a valid web page. It's just, uh, it's just the wrong web page, not the web page that we wanted to visit. And this error 404 indicates to us that actually this web page doesn't even exist. There's a lot of different, uh, this is called an error code in, uh, in web programming, and there's a lot of different 
uh, possible error codes, but 404 is probably the most famous one, just indicating that the URL that you're visiting does not exist. I wanna see what that looks like inside of Python now. So I've created this really gibberish sort of URL that doesn't exist. Let's go back over to Python and see what that uh, gibberish sort of URL might look like. And let's do that, and then a whole bunch of gibberish like this. And let's save this and rerun our program. And you can see actually that I didn't get any error messages. When we open an incorrect file, when we open an incorrect file, Python gave us an error message. But when we open an incorrect URL, Python sometimes does and sometimes does not give us an error. And so I wanna see, uh, we're gonna investigate exactly what's going on here and it has to do with why um, or how URLs and how web requests are a little bit more complicated than, than files. So um, let's first start by taking a look at now our Dracula.html file that we just downloaded. And you can see that, uh, that it contains this title 404. It's very different than the, the HTML file that we used to have when we had the correct HTML. And this 404, again, indicates that we had that, uh, that 404 error message. And if we looked through here carefully, we'd see that this HTML is actually the same HTML that corresponds to this web page right here. So back in wget, when you do requests.get like this, there's another thing inside of this R variable called the status code, R dot status code. And the status code tells us what number uh, the status of the web page is. And so if R dot status code equals 404 like this, then this indicates that our web page didn't exist, that we had an error um, while, while doing the downloading. And so let's print error 404 like this. I'm gonna save that, come down back here into Python and rerun this. And we get error 404 because this right here is not a valid URL. If I change this again, deleting this code at the end of the URL and saving that, then come down here and rerun this. We'll see that there is no error 404 because this was a valid HTML object. This begs the question of like, what's the status code of a valid HTML return when the, uh, the web page actually exists? And that status code is uh, r dot status code equals 200. So 404 indicates uh, the URL is not found and 200 is success. Everything worked correctly. And when we have the success status code, then we'll store the text actually in the text. But when we have, um, when we don't have the success, we're just going to print the error 404 and, and be done with our program. In order to make this uh, down here actually load with the, or only only save when we have a success, error 200, status code 200. We can indent all of this. So now all of this, the saving the file actually only happens when we have the status code 200. Is there a good time now for us to pause and um, uh, see if there's any questions? Um, The key takeaway about things so far are that if things are successful, the status code is 200. If things are, uh, if things fail, there's many ways that things can fail. One of the ways that things can fail is that we have the status code 404 uh, indicating that the URL is incorrect. And we'll see here in a little bit some other ways that things can fail and how to detect that in Python. Uh, Kier, was that a question? Yeah, I, I was just curious if um, 
you mentioned earlier that like some websites like for LinkedIn, for example, that they'd have to mm-hmm. implement some tech way of preventing this. So like, is, is there a way that we're going to see like, is it in the HTML or is there another way that we can like see if we're allowed to even download it? Like what are, I don't yeah, this, know. Is, this is a great question. Um, basically, so there's another uh, status code, R dot status code equals 503. Um, and what, uh, so I'm not gonna do anything for that right now. What, what 503 means is that you don't have permission to access the URL. And there's many reasons why you might not have permission to access the URL, but the, uh, from the purpose of uh, web scraping, the most common one is that you're just downloading too much stuff. So um, all of these major web pages like LinkedIn, Google, um, anything that anybody that has data that other people might want, they have a limit on how many uh, how many times a certain IP address, so a certain computer, can visit a URL in any given time period. And usually those limits are pretty high, like uh, maybe a hundred times per second, or a thousand times an hour, or ten thousand times a day. Something that's high enough that no human would ever like get that error message. Um, but that if you're a computer just scraping everything, then you'll get that error message pretty quickly. Okay. Uh, like, oh, sorry. Uh, the, the other thing that I was going to say is that um, right now we're talking about like how to download information from the web. Uh, when in about maybe three or four weeks from now, we're going to talk about like how you use Python to actually create a website that's dynamic. So our final project in this class is going to be creating a, a Twitter clone. And at that point, we'll be able to talk about like how do these websites actually implement these countermeasures to prevent people from scraping. Okay. Yeah. And I guess as like a follow up to that, like, are there, are there like methods that like people can go about? Like, 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 can you bounce between different IP addresses and like, like if you know what to look for, are there like ways to get around it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, so questions basically like, how can we uh, get around all this? And there's this big sort of like cat and mouse game. Uh, it's kind of illustrated here in this uh, comic about um, there's groups of people who are like trying to scrape information from web pages and then groups of people who are trying to stop other people from scraping it. And uh, it's just a big cat and mouse game about implementing these technical measures of, of how to do this. Your suggestion about using different IP addresses is, uh, is a really good one. Um, it's also a, it's a, a really expensive one because uh, IP addresses are relatively expensive. Um, uh, yeah, as we as we see more uh, examples of of web scraping and get towards more the end of the class, we'll be able to flesh out some of those ideas on on how to actually um, how to do this. Um, I guess the easiest way is just if a website allows you to download whatever whatever their number is, like a thousand web pages per day, then you just download a thousand per day and do it for the, over the course of a year and eventually you'll get everything that they have. Okay, cool. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, great questions. Any other questions at this point? Okay. So uh, again, real quick review, what we've, we've done so far is this requests has this get, you pass in a URL, it gives us what's called a requests object, I'm just calling it R, that R has two important pieces of information inside of it, the status code and the text. The text is the stuff that we actually want, the stuff that we wanna use, and the status code lets us know if there was an error. Uh, but the weird thing is that there will always be text, even if there are certain types of errors, like the, the 404 error, just because um, web pages will still return text if there's, if, there's an, if there are certain types of errors associated with them. And the main sort of error that you're going to see is this error 404 of the URL is not found. And that happens when there's a typo in your URL. And in particular, when there's a typo after the domain name of the URL. 
So this part of the URL right here is called the domain name. This part of the URL over here is called the path of the URL. Um, I think the first week of class I gave you a cheat sheet that uh, talks about the different parts of uh, domain names. Uh, but what we need to know now is this is the path, this is the uh, domain, and this part right here is called the scheme. So let's type that out. Looks like scheme colon slash slash domain slash path. And uh, the domain commonly has various dots inside of it, but it's not required to. If there's an error in the path and only in the path, that's where you get the status code 404. If there's an error in any other part of the URL, whether it's the domain or the scheme, then we'll get uh, a different error message. So to illustrate that, I'm going to change this HTTPS to um, something that doesn't exist. So HTTPS not valid, that's, that's not anything that is, is a valid scheme. And so when I save this up here and come down here and rerun this file, now I'm going to get an actual Python error message. And this Python error message right here, requests.exceptions.missingschema, invalid URL, this right here. Um, so anytime you see in this, the last line of your error message, it says something about like a schema missing or a scheme is wrong, then uh, you need to look at your URL just before the colon slash slash, what's wrong with it. A really common way for this to happen is that if you don't have anything, um, so you just have the domain and then a set of uh, the path here. If you have this, that's going to give you this uh, same error message of not having a schema. So with Python, it's always required that you do the either HTTP colon slash slash or HTTPS colon slash slash at the beginning of your URL. If you're missing that, then you're gonna get this confusing error message of missing schema. The other source of error messages is here in the domain. And this one, there's, um, there's lots and lots of possible error messages that can happen here. So uh, let's go ahead and just type in a domain that doesn't exist. Here's another thing that doesn't exist. There is no .org, however you would pronounce that. And so when I run, save this, come down here and run it, then um, I'm gonna get this connection error. And this connection error is, I think a little bit confusing because really what's happened, like when you see something that says connection error, that makes me think that maybe like my internet's not working or um, yeah, that maybe like my Wi-Fi connection's bad or it's too slow right now, something along those lines. But usually the main cause of a connection error is some typo in this part of your uh, URL in the domain. The reason this is, gives you a connection error is because uh, Python is trying to connect to this address uh, and it's actually sending out the requests onto the internet to connect to this address. And we talked about those routers before on the internet that process all of these connections and those routers are saying that this doesn't exist in anywhere they can reach. And so those routers are sending back the connection error and, um, and that's, that's what that means. So, um, Connection error, it's possible that, you're, that your internet's down, but that's really easy for you to check if you can just open up Firefox and visit a web page. More likely, it's that you have a typo here in the domain portion of your URL. Save that, come down here, rerun it, and, and now everything works because this URL is a valid URL. I think now's another good time to pause for questions. Um, just again, real quick recap, we talked about errors in the path. Do not trigger Python to cause errors. They give you a status code, which is different than 200. Usually it'll be a 404 status code. Errors in your domain right here. There can be many, many different error messages, but the most common one is a connection error, and it means that you have a typo in your domain. Uh, if you are missing this part over here or have a typo in this part over here, you get the schema error. 
Any questions about any of that? Yeah, um, that Massad, whoever. Um, yeah, Professor, uh, I was just wondering, um, the dot status code is part of the requests uh, request domain or the request uh, library? Uh, exactly, the, the dot status code here um, is implemented as part of the requests library. Um, so you, yeah, you don't have to do anything special to get access to this uh, after you pip install requests, then, then you get access to it. Okay. Um, let's see, whoever just raised your hand, go ahead. Um, so how does the program know that when you run this, um, that the file name should be Dracula because the file name, I don't know if I'm missing it, but is that part of the code anywhere? Oh, it's underneath, I think, at the file. Yeah, so, so right here, I've, um, I've hard coded uh, two what we call string literals. So the strings actually in quotation marks, uh, the URL and the file name. So here, file name is Dracula.html. And then down here in my call to open, um, this file name refers directly to Dracula.html. Um, so if I change this URL to something that wasn't related to Dracula, then I'd probably want to change this file name as well. Did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Great. Um, so that's actually a really good segue into what we're going to talk about next. Um, so in some sense, actually, at this point, we've talked about everything that you need to do for, uh, uh, for web scraping, that we now have access to, uh, like, given a URL, extract the information from that URL. What we're going to talk about next is um, how to make things a little bit nicer while you do that. And that's what the wget2.py file is for. We're going to talk about ways to make uh, extracting information from the web just a little bit nicer and more user friendly. The difference between the wget2.py and the wget.py is wget2 has these lines right here. Um, and those replace these two lines inside of the wget.py. These lines right here are going to allow us to get information from the command line, so from the terminal area down here, and pass it into our program. And when I do that, I'm going to be able to, instead of like hard coding this URL value and this file name, let it be something that the user can specify when they're running the program so that they can download not just this URL, but download any URL they want and make their file name not just dracula.html, but make it whatever is appropriate for, um, for that particular context. So uh, what I'm gonna do here is um, first show uh, how to run this wget2.py program, and then we're gonna talk about exactly what these four lines here are doing. So down here in the terminal, so previously I was doing python3 wget.py, now I'm gonna do python3 wget2.py. And when I run this, I get this error message. And this error message might look a little bit familiar to you from the Markdown compiler assignments. That with the Markdown compiler, uh, if you ran your program like this without specifying additional information, then you would get a usage error saying that there was more things expected. And uh, it was this, um, uh, so this library called argparse right here, which is getting information from the command line and passing it into Python. Here, when I want to get this information, um, let's see, the first thing that I'm gonna do is when I run wget2.py down here, if I do a dash dash help at the end, it gives me some useful uh, information about what this program is supposed to do. So right here, it tells me like the purpose of the program, download a web page, 
and uh, these positional arguments are the things that I can pass into this program. So the URL and the file name. The things that I used to previously have hard-coded are now things that I'll be able to actually pass in. And um, this usage tells me like where those are supposed to go. So when I type Python 3 space wget2.py space and anything in square brackets means it's optional. You don't have to include it. If I did include the dash H right here, that opens up this help message. Um, but it's optional, so I don't have to include that. And then the next thing here is the URL that I would want to use. And we'll start by just copying and pasting this URL like this. And then the next thing is um, the file name. And the file name was dracula.html. And up I'll hit enter. And then um, everything uh, works like it did before. I'll go ahead and delete this dracula.html file so that we can see that it'll create a new one for us. There's um, a couple of subtleties about these command line parameters. Anything that you type in on the command line is called a command line parameter or a command line argument. And the first one is that you're allowed to use quotation marks, and, but you don't have to. So here, this one right here, this URL, I put inside of single quotation marks, but then the Dracula.html, I didn't put inside of quotation marks at all. And uh, that's totally okay. Uh, you don't have to use quotation marks, or if you want to use quotation marks, you're allowed to. It doesn't matter at all. These quotation marks will get removed so that it's only the stuff inside of the quotation marks that gets displayed. The other thing is where do, where do these, uh, inside of Python, where do these uh, pieces of information get stored? And that's uh, explained, that's what these four lines of code do is explain that. I'll talk about that here in a second, uh, but uh, was that Eddie? Do you have a question? Yeah, so I have a question regarding um, uh, when I was running the Python wet get to with, mm -hmm. um, with a URL, it's giving me an error. The following arguments are required file name, which is the file name above. Um, so the, the wget2 requires two different parameters. Um, this, so here I'm pressing in this parameter, and it's a little bit confusing because it's on a second line down here, but that uh, second parameter. And you have to have both of these two parameters. Um, yeah, if you can't get this to work, then after class, this would be a good time to, uh, uh, we can share screens and go through that. Oh, yeah, it worked. Thank you. You're yep, welcome. Uh, was that Sophia? Do you have a question too? Yeah, I have a quick question. I got the um, error that says like no such file or directory. I was wondering why it gets that um, since you didn't call like any relative or absolute path on yours, right? You just ran Python 3 wget2.py. Um, let's see. That's a, uh, I'm going to change this to uh, do something like this. And so here I've passed in not just a single file name, but a, a path. And this path is going to a folder called test. And, um, and this is resulting in this error message. And the question is that uh, Sophia was getting this error message and what are some of the possible causes of getting an error message like this? And the answer is that somehow the, um, uh, the the second argument, so the file name argument, um, is specifying a location that doesn't exist. There's, my best guess about uh, what could be going on here is that if you have the order of these two arguments backwards, let's see what happens there. Um, okay, so that gives us our missing schema because this is being interpreted as the URL and every URL has to start with uh, HTTPS colon slash slash. Um, yeah, I guess uh, it's not, I'm not sure exactly what might be the problem with you, with your, um, with your setup, but um, after class I can take a look at that in more detail if, if it's still not working. 
Um, good questions. Um, Eddie, another question? Yes, uh, it's a quick, quick one. So the reason why we have two arguments is because we have two added arguments. Is that correct? Okay, yeah. So um, this question is going to segue us into our next topic where we're talking about how exactly the stuff on the command line down here gets linked into the stuff inside of Python. And whenever you're using uh, in Python trying to get these parameters from, um, from the command line into Python, you always have this on line 12 and this on line 15. Um, that this sort of initializes, it tells Python that you are going to be getting information from the command line. And this one down here actually uh, gets that information. These two uh, lines right here actually specify what is the information that we should be getting from the uh, command line. And here, I um, uh, this add argument function, it takes two parameters, the name of the parameter. So here, URL and file name are the names of my parameters. And then I'm also providing this sort of help information. And this help information is totally optional. It's just uh, the purpose of it is as for people who are using your program, when they do that Python 3 wget2.py dash dash help or just dash h, it uh, corresponds to these messages that get displayed down here. Um, so these are, they don't affect the, what the program does in any way, it's just uh, helpful for the people using your code. Similarly, this description right here doesn't actually affect what the, the program does in any way. You could omit it and things would still work totally fine. Um, but it makes the help a little bit more informative because it tells you what the, um, the program actually does. The, um, the order of these two arguments, the order that you put all of these arguments in is important because uh, they'll be the order that they have to be passed in on the command line with when you run actually Python wget2.py and then the names of the arguments. Here, because I'm putting the URL first and file name second, on the, the usage down here, URL comes first and file name comes second. So when I call this program, I have to call it first with the URL like this, and then second with the file name like this. If I change that order, then uh, the program wouldn't work anymore unless I switch my file, move that Dracula.html to the very beginning, and now, um, oops, and up here, save it, and down here, now it should keep working. So then the question uh, is, how do we get access to this file name and this URL actually within Python? And uh, previously, in the wget.py, we just have a uh, part called, uh, or our variables called URL and file name. And now when we do it, instead of doing URL and file name, we'll do args.url and args.filename because something was passed in as a param command line parameter up here, it now exists as the variable args.url for this one and args.filename for this one. Did that, Eddie, answer your question somewhere in there? Or yep. do you have another question? Yep, yep. thank you. Yep. Um, Typically, when I'm writing a, uh, a program in Python, um, the vast majority of my programs will start with a section of code that looks something like this and has these, uh, these some set of parameters like this that can be specified in advance. And um, that way, um, yeah, that way the, the program's a little bit more flexible. You can use it on the command line like this. A really important or really useful feature of this arg parse is that you can also specify what's called a default parameter. And so let's say my uh, file name, I want, like I don't wanna have to always specify a file name like this. I only wanna sometimes specify a file name, but I do always wanna specify a URL. Then I can make this file name optional by putting a dash dash in front of it. 
And then over here, I can say a default value for what the file name should be if it's not provided. And we'll make the default value dracula.html like this. Now down here, when I run this, I don't pass in the dracula.html, I just pass in the URL. And this will uh, still work. It'll still create my dracula.html file. Go ahead and delete this over here to illustrate that. And then back over here, um, rerun this. And you can see dracula.html was recreated because my file name variable, my args.file name here is defaulting to dracula.html because I didn't specify it. If I do want to specify it to be something, then I can say dash dash um, file name equals, and maybe this time I'll call it index.html. And now if we look over here, it created this file index.html instead of dracula.html. Charlie? Um, if you make both of the arguments optional and the terminal only supplies one of them, how do you choose which one, like which argument gets chosen? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, so the question is, what if we made both of these arguments optional and then how in the terminal do we differentiate between them? So I'm gonna start by making this optional and then specifying another default value like this. And I'll just copy and paste our URL right here into there. And we'll save that. And now down here, um, I'm just going to, I'll run this in, with a variety of different uh, settings so that we can see what's going to happen. Um, and actually, to really make it easy to follow, we're just going to print out the different arguments. So print args dot file name equals args dot file name and print args dot url equals args dot url like this and now when i run it down in the uh the terminal with no command line parameters we can see that the file name and url are both equal to their default values up here uh, whatever i specified in default is what gets placed down here because there's no uh, no arguments or no parameters on the command line. Now I'm going to add a URL and let's specify the URL is um, we'll do my personal blog is biggie.me like this and I'll hit enter and now the URL is biggie.me file name remains as Dracula. If I wanted the file name to change, but not the URL to change, file name equals index.html, then now the file name has changed and the URL has not changed. The URL stays as the default. If I want to specify both the file name and the URL, um, dash dash URL equals wiki.me like this, then, um, I, I specify both a dash dash file name and a dash dash URL. And here the order doesn't matter. Um, you can specify it in either order, dash dash URL equals that, and it still gets them in the, in the right locations down here. The way that Python knows that like this should be the URL right here is because we have this dash dash URL and the way it knows this should be the file name is we have the dash dash file name. When we didn't have the dash dash up here, then uh, Python used the order that the arguments were specified in in order to determine what goes in which location. Uh, but when you use the dash dash, Python doesn't care about the order and instead you have to specify a dash dash equals. Um, in order to in order to set the the variable from the command line, um, great question. Yeah, go ahead, Charlotte. Um, so what happens if you uh, like before instead of specifying dash um, something something, you just have whatever argument, just a single one. So something like like this. Oh, uh, just one of them. 
without having to build it. So if on the um, if you specify in Python a dash dash up here, then down in the terminal you must use a dash dash when you call the wget function. If there's if there's no dash dash, then you um, then you don't use a dash dash inside of the uh, inside of the terminal function. Um, so it's it's just two different ways of uh, of specifying the the different command line arguments. Um, I guess so. Typically, if anything is sort of like um, well, so if something is optional, then you have to use this dash dash procedure or this dash dash method. If something is required, then uh, then you can use the dash dash or not use the dash dash. Typically for required things, people would use uh, like not a dash dash and uh, the plain uh, name of the variable like this. The, um, in this case, for like a wget program, it doesn't make sense to run the program if no URL is provided. So um, most wget programs have a URL as a required parameter, and then they would have many, um, potentially hundreds of different uh, um, parameters with dash dash parameters. With the uh, YouTube uh, DL program, if we do the dash dash help, it'll print out all sorts of different parameters that it has. Um, as optional parameters, anything down here with the dash dash, all optional. And if we come up to the very top, it'll show us eventually the the uh, the usage. And so it's YouTube DL, all the optional stuff, and here then this URL is required because it's not in uh, not in the square brackets. So the YouTube DL is sort of like a a very advanced version of this uh, program that we've created here has URL required and has lots of dash dash optional parameters. Um, Eddie, I see your hand up. Yes, so um, a small question is that if, so the, what's the functional default? Does it mean that uh, if I type in um, only the dash dash file name, it will give me just the default without uh, if if you don't type in dash dash file name, it will give you the uh, default. So here, let's save this up above, run this. And here, um, I did not put in a dash dash file name down here. There's no dash dash file name. And so uh, the file name is defaulted to dracula.html. I see. So only when there's dash dash file name, there will be considered another the file exactly now if i do dash dash file name equals um, test dot then now the file name is has been specified to be this instead of this did that answer your question yeah perfectly thank you yeah. um Let's see, so how this is going to uh, come up in your next homework assignment is that you'll be writing a Python program from scratch that will be a, uh, an eBay downloader that will, uh, you'll, be, you'll be able to type in search, search terms and it'll download the information for those search terms. And you'll have to be able to specify on the command line what those search terms are supposed to be. Um, so that's how this uh, R parser will come up. And then um, uh, that'll connect with the downloading from eBay by using this requests um, library like this. There's one last part that we'll need for the homework. And that's uh, once we have an HTML file and we've loaded it into memory, either by uh, downloading it like this or maybe loading it from a file, how do we actually process that uh, HTML file in a useful way? And that's what this notes.py file is going to talk about. And so this notes.py file uh, starts off with uh, part one where we're loading text. And um, so there's these three methods right here that we've talked about for loading text into uh, Python. Uh, you can either just like put in a string literal like this, 
and that's useful for like very small strings. Um, but if it's uh, if it's something that changes or something that should be user specified, then then this is not a useful method. The next method that we saw was you working with files, and files is one of the more versatile methods of like having uh, optional data or big data sets that we can process and load into Python because we can change the file name and load up whatever we want to. And then today we talked about the requests library um, using just these relatively simple few lines. Uh, we'll get something from a URL instead of from a file and put it into Python. We've also talked about this arg parse library that gets something from the command line down here. Um, but uh, I'm not putting that in, in our code right here. And again, the main time that you would use arg parse is not to like actually get data. You very rarely have like a big data set specified on the command line, but instead you would use arg parse to like specify the URL or specify the file name, which you would then load with the requests library or the open function. But these are four different methods of getting strings into Python from different data sources. And then we also have different techniques of once we have a string, how do we process it? And uh, so here, I'm just going to start by focusing on the text2 technique. So text2 here comes from the Dracula.html file. And then um, our first method, which we've spent uh, a fair amount of time in class doing, is all of our string, different types of string functions. So our replace, our lower, and our find. Uh, slices and indexing. And uh, if you started the, uh, the lab that's doing Halloween yet, then uh, you'll be very familiar with having to do a lot of replace functions of replacing Count Dracula with Professor Asbicki throughout the um, throughout the HTML file using these regular string functions. In your homework, you're working a lot with this JSON.loads. And this JSON lot dot loads, um, it doesn't work with the examples that we have above because those examples that we have above, they're all HTML files. So here's an HTML file. This is loading an HTML file. And this is all HTML. So I have json.loads commented out right here. Um, we'd have to change our text from HTML to JSON in order for this to make sense. But today we're going to talk about, um, and it's really quick, easy to do, how to use uh, this library called BS4. Uh, BS stands for beautiful soup in order to process HTML. And um, uh, so two lines right here. This loads up our uh, beautiful soup library. And then this line right here converts the beautiful soup, converts the text into what's called a soup object. And this line right here is something that's always just um, like standard copy and paste between your projects, just like this is standard copy and paste between projects. That this beautiful soup function is sort of like the same thing as json.loads, only for HTML. It takes text as input and gives us something that we can easily manipulate as output. The, mo the most common thing that we're going to do with this soup object, the only thing that you'll need to be able to do for your uh, homework assignment, uh, uh, that's the eBay scraping homework assignment, is the select function. And what this select function does is it returns, or you, what you, you pass in is a CSS selector. So we, if you remember from way back at the beginning of class, um, when you were writing CSS to modify your HTML, we look at the Dracula.html. It has some uh, CSS selectors for us up here. All of these things to the left of the curly braces, these are different CSS selectors. And um, the soup.select, you pass in a CSS selector, and it gives you a list of all of the items, all of the HTML tags that match that CSS selector. So in order to see how that works, I'm going to load up our notes.py file in interactive Python. And it takes a second to load because it's doing the download uh, of the web page. And uh, now we have this soup object and this a tags object. And uh, if I just type in a tags like this, you see that it gives me a list as a result. I know it's a list because it ends in a square bracket. I also know it's a list 
um, because I can do this oops, type of a tags like this, and it tells me that it's a list. And uh, so if it's a list, I can do all my normal list operations on it, like a tags of zero. And this gives me just the first a tag, the first link inside of the, um, the Dracula.html file. I can get the, say the 12th link like this. Here's a link that goes to chapter 11 of Dracula. And then anytime I have one of these uh, tags, have access to one of these tags, there's two pieces of information that I might want to extract from the tag. Like what is the location that it's linking to and what is the actual like value of the text here. In order to get the location that it's linking to um, or in order to get any HTML attribute extracted from the tag, what you do is, so here's my tag. Let's go ahead and just make that as a variable. That's my tag. Uh, inside of square brackets, tag is sort of like a dictionary where all of the attributes, all of the HTML attributes are the keys of the dictionary. I can do that to get just um, chapter 11 like this. And um, if there were some images, so let's do soup.select. Let's find all of the images in there that we have these two images and let's find the zeroth image like this and now if I want the title I can do that to get the title happens to be empty if I want the width do that to get the width if I want the source do that so any um, Again, this right here gives me a single HTML tag. Any one of these tags, you can index with the appropriate attribute to get what the value of that attribute is. For a tag that is not self-closing, a tag that has a, both an opening tag and a an closing tag, uh, you can get the information between those two tags by doing tag.text, and that gives you back the information. You'll notice here that it has these weird sort of Unicode markups because here, uh, Weston Ross has this A hat right here. And these two uh, characters right here are, are part of that uh, Unicode markup. Um, so that was a real quick overview of this beautiful soup library uh, on class on Wednesday. I'm gonna be using all three of these libraries put together to solve the, um, uh, the next homework assignment and we'll be going over the next homework assignment. Um, so it would be good to review your CSS selectors before class on, on Wednesday. Um, um, yeah. I think um, this is pretty much all the time that we have for a class right now. So I'll say this is the official end of class, but I'm happy to stay on and I'll leave the uh, video recording for a while to answer questions that people have about, um, uh, about this, um, this beautiful soup library or about um, uh, uh, anything else, the, the homework that's due on Tuesday. Um, but maybe, before I open it up for questions, I'll just thank you all again for being patient with the, uh, uh, the COVID changes and uh, the fact that we have to, to go online here for a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. William, so, go ahead. Um, yeah, so I had a question. I, I don't know if I missed it in class, but can you just talk again about what the point is of using the dash dash that we used in the um, wget2 file? Sure. Um, so the, um, the dash dash is different from no dash dash because it lets you specify a default value. So here with the URL, I I have specified a default value like this, but it doesn't actually use the default value. So this is really like, that's a better, uh, that's a more correct thing here. The dash dash lets me specify the default value. And when I have the default value, it means that I can do, 
and only have the, the URL like this. And then I don't have to manually specify the file name because it has a default file name for me. Uh, so that's really the, uh, the main, if you want to have something where you don't have to specify the file name every time, then you should use the dash dash. If you want them, to, like force them to specify the file name every time, then you should use no dash dash. Okay, did, thank you. Did that answer the question? Mm-hmm. Um, good question. Uh, Sophia? Um, can I ask a question about the lab or should I do that another time? Let's just uh, wait a minute to see if, uh, okay. if there's any other questions about the class material today and then, um, and then we'll go on to uh, lab sort of stuff. Okay. Um, Arian? Hi, Professor. Uh, could you possibly go over again, like, uh, you know, with the soup that select, for the, if you could just scroll up to the tag part. Uh, no, not there, actually, in the terminal. Um, so I understand how you did the image. So we're basically, we were selecting an, any, an image tag and then we're specifying which image and so forth. Mm -hmm. Could you scroll up to the A when you were selecting the A? Okay. So you had said tag, okay. So tag was, you had said the tag is equivalent to a certain a tag and mm -hmm. that's why we could do tag dot text uh, to get the text in between that specific a tag is that correct? exactly yeah and a tags like how did we come up with the name of a tags again like uh, is that from somewhere um that's from the code up here um okay a tags is the soup dot selective a got it makes sense now thank you yep, you're welcome um Professor, I have a question regarding the uh, BS4. Sure. So basically, Beautiful Soup, it's essentially exclusively a converter or selector for CSS or slash HTML, right? Uh, or, or, or not selector, like the parser. So that's, yeah, beautiful soup is technically called a parser of HTML. Um, okay. The main thing that we'll use in this class is this select function, um, which lets you, works like this, but there's a lot of other stuff built into beautiful Gotcha. Soup. So your quotation A, so is it only looking for A or is it looking for the tag A? So this is a CSS selector. So um, okay. it'd be like if we had changed this to A right here, Whatever okay. things this would match, that's what's okay. going to get returned. Gotcha. That's a CSS selector. Gotcha. Yeah. Real quick. So let's just try like P greater than A. So find mm -hmm. any um, A tags that are inside of P tags like mm -hmm. that. And, um, and it turns out there's two of them. I see. And what if I want to look for the entirety of all the file? So then I don't need a second variable of a tags, right? Uh, so if you only if you wanted just the p like all of the p tags in the file, soup dot select p like that gives us all the p tags, and there's a lot of them. I see. Gotcha. So this function, well, not this function. This uh, beautiful soup will help me to find and replace. Is that how they're replacing the text? That's a good or? question. So um, mm -hmm. it is possible to do replacing of text with beautiful soup, but it's um, uh, it's difficult and not something that you want to do. Okay, so, so it's, like not, lab, it's not it's not it's not much really easier. Need. Okay. For the lab you want to just use the um, the the string replace function. Okay. All right. All right, that's fine. I was I, I was thinking it will be easier because I don't know if there's a function for this specific library. Um, um, no, not really. Then. Yeah, if, if if there was like a really complicated replace that you wanted to do, then Beautiful Soup could be easier for that. Gotcha. But, um, just understanding like how the replace works inside of Beautiful Soup mm -hmm. that really requires um, having taken the data structures course, which is the follow on gotcha. course for this. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right, lovely. Thank you very much. That pretty much is all.
Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you. You too, Eddie. Um, any other questions about any class material before we move on to homework lab questions? Okay, um, I think Sophia, you had asked about the lab. So why don't we, we'll start with you and start with questions about lab and then uh, move on to homework questions after that. Oh, but it looks like Sophia is not here anymore. Uh, so anybody else then who wants to jump in with a question about either, um, uh, either lab or homework, feel free to do so. Um, I jumped into the question about the lab. So after mm -hmm. we've done like the text.replace, how do we resave the HTML file to our like new version, if that makes sense? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, let's see, I'm going to uh, stop my recording here for a second. And I'm actually going to just uh, pull up the, um, pull up my solution and you can take a look at that to see what I'm doing. Okay. Um, but Zoom seems to be a little bit frozen for me for a second. 